Okay, I'm back from Japan, I had a great time, but now it's time to do this Q&A. Thanks to everyone for asking questions, I really appreciate it. I have more than enough here to fill a video, I might actually have to split this in two parts. So you guys made this easy for me, thank you for asking so many questions after only two videos. I've put the handles of everyone that I answer in this video in the description. That way, if you ask the question, you don't have to sit there in suspense waiting to find out if I answered you. You can just look in the description. And as a general disclaimer, I want you to know that I will be overreacting to your questions. I, I tricked you. I trapped you. I'm just going to use your question as a way to diagnose your goddamn soul because I don't know you in person. The question really doesn't tell me all that much about the context of your situation. Sorry for that in advance. And I also want to say that I'm going to wing it on answering these without a script. So if I take your question the wrong way, if I come at it from the wrong tack, I'm sorry. Feel free to ask it again with clarification and I will get to it in another video or I'll respond in a comment. All right, so let's start here. This first question is from Simon. I'm going to read Simon's full comment and then I'll give my answer. So Simon says, what are your thoughts about motivation? Everyone struggles with it, some more than others. I keep hearing that you must find the thing you love about your craft to keep yourself going and keep pushing even if you don't feel like it. For me, it got to a point where I would draw every day more or less, but I would also feel guilty for not drawing when I knew I could have, and it became less fun. I decided to take a break for a month and not worry about drawing all the time. I totally needed it. When I got back into drawing, it felt great. It was more fun than before but I still have that feeling of guilt occasionally creeping up on me, and I don't know if it's a good thing or not. It keeps me going, but it doesn't always feel great. I want to draw more, but at the same time not. It's a weird struggle for me, but I'm trying to stay positive. I like drawing after all. All right, Simon, great question, and one that I think is very relatable for people. I think there's a lot of artists out there who have encountered this particular constellation of resistance and ambition. And it is a complicated thing. I'm not sure if there is a clean answer for it. So let me just start with the brunt of your question. What do I think about motivation? Motivation is real, but it is kind of arbitrary on its own, right? There is a such thing as motivation just presenting itself from nowhere as this overwhelming surge of energy and focus and aspiration. But it's unreliable in that pure state. You're going to have days where you are naturally more motivated and you're going to have a lot of other days where you are very naturally unmotivated. So it's nice to ride that wave when it's present, but it's not something to build an art practice on completely on its own. You need to have habits in place that produce, let's say, artificial motivation, right? You just have this habit, you are very used to sitting down at this time to begin this kind of work, and even if you are motivated or not, once you've been doing it for a few minutes, it sort of gets the engine cranked and you get going. But it, the habits, yeah, yeah, I think you're encountering the other side of the habituation process. The habits, after they have been put into place, after they have created the routine, which is essential, they can put you in this place where they also produce negative aspects. There can definitely be an addictive quality to deeply ingraining those habits in your life. You know, you sort of get used to the dopamine rush that can come from feeling that you studied, feeling that you made progress, right? Especially if there's not a lot of dopamine hits coming in other parts of your life, right? You will very quickly get addicted to that. And yeah, if you stop drawing, if you break the habit, it's very natural for the guilt to creep in. So I would say it is definitively not a bad thing. It's a sign of a good thing. And if it creeps up on you on occasion still, just recognize it when it comes up, connect with it, and remind yourself that it is a natural product of a good thing that you did. And I think eventually that will sort of minimize its effect. And remember to go with the flow. If you have already proven to yourself that you can 
put these habits into your daily life, then you have a little more leeway to take days off, load days with extra work, to sort of explore the spectrum of effort and workload, which you already are doing, it seems. I think it was a very wise choice to take a month break if you were experiencing that weird struggle, right? Because that gave you data. And it's very good data, it seems. So again, Simon, thanks for the question. I'm not sure how to pronounce this, but Brian Hermeline said, interesting. And that's all I can say for now. Look forward to check your other videos out. I'm sure I'm in for a treat. This makes me wonder if the process of making art in and of itself is meditation or not. Hmm. This isn't really a question, but I just wanted to commune with you on that point. I think the process of making art in and of itself is definitely a meditation, in quotes. That is to say that what you are doing in both cases is the same. You are monitoring mental and bodily processes. You are keeping track of them. You are being aware of them as best as you can. And in many situations, you are skillfully guiding them, but with the acknowledgement that there is only so much control you can really have over these processes that are running. I think there's a lot more parallels there than that. Uh, I'll probably wind up talking about a lot of that as time goes on on this channel. But yes, just wanted to say I do agree. I do think that the process of making art and something like meditation are are basically one and the same. It was all one practice, baby. Potato says, really liked your thoughts. The only other person to get me to think about these kinds of philosophy is Alan Watts. So I guess my question would be, who are some of your favorite philosophers? Uh, thanks for the question, Potato. And that's an interesting one. Uh, I've never really thought about who my favorite philosophers would be, but definitely Alan Watts would be up there. He is a constant companion for long hours of working. Um, I've explored some of the m writings of the more traditional philosophers. I've definitely spent time reading Nietzsche or listening to explanations of his viewpoint, some Kant, um, really a, a lot of the basics, you know, Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, you wind up picking up a lot of that just from culture, but I've also read some of it and listened to a bunch of information about it. Though honestly, I feel like you'd take the Buddha as a religious figure on face value, but I think of someone like the Buddha as as a philosopher, right? I'm not, I'm not a highly religious person, but um, the teachings that are contained in those doctrines are uh, extremely interesting to me philosophically. Same with the words of Jesus, same with info that is in the Upanishads and the Vedas. And I mean, we, we can go down a whole rabbit hole with all of those things, but uh, to stretch the boundaries of the question a little bit, I probably think of the words of the Buddha more than I do uh, any, la any philosopher you would label a traditional philosopher. And Alan Watts, a lot of Alan Watts. And I'm um, very glad and flattered that I could take your thoughts down some of the same roads as Alan Watts. That's, uh, what more could I ask for? Thanks, Potato. Tim Tran has some very good questions. So one, you said that learning becomes almost automatic, provided that you have exposure, instruction, and practice. Could you go into more detail about what constitutes each of these three elements? I've always been told that when practicing, you need to be extremely analytical and constantly pushing the boundaries of what you are capable of doing. But this tends to pull me out of the flow state. Would you agree with this? Or do you think that practice should be done in the flow state as well? So first off, let me point out that you don't need to do anything. You said you've always been told that when practicing, you need to be in a be extremely analytical and constantly pushing the boundaries of what you're capable of doing. Not true. That's an opinion. That is a viewpoint that is going to sometimes be a useful one. And there is progress to be made there. But you don't need to do that. You can practice, you can execute, you can make your art, whatever you want. And you can set whatever goals for how you want to feel while you do it, that you want anything that you can imagine because art is nothing. It has no defined form. It has no dogmatic way that it needs to be experienced. And 
it, you couldn't make a case otherwise, right? It's completely nebulous. You couldn't put your finger on it. There, there is no, it has no shape, it has no form. So it can be whatever you want. Just to point out, it doesn't need to be anything. So no, you do not always need to be in a hyper analytical state when you are practicing. I would say that you're, like you said at the end of your question, practice should be done in the flow state as well as much as you can experience the flow state without without force, you know, without feeling like you need to demand it, right? Like it is also okay to work through strain and being accepting of that allows the flow state to naturally arrive. I personally would go more for practicing in the flow state, but even that does not need to be. You have to set your own personal standards for how you want to feel while you work. So back to the first part of your question, what a little more detail about what constitutes those three elements. Learning requires exposure, instruction, and practice. So exposure is pretty straightforward. You probably already do this automatically because you are a consumer of art. Your exposure to contemporary work that you're interested in, right? Illustration, design, drawings, that sets a bar in your mind for what is good technically, what is good emotively, that's just, that's pretty natural, right? It's very rare for an artist to not also be a consumer of art to at least some capacity. Um, and there's also the factor of exposure to particular learning ideas, right? That is also an important part of exposure. And you can get a lot of that from just listening to other artists, hearing how they learned what their journey was. Instruction, I do think is important. It's not it, It's not completely necessary, right? You can obviously learn on your own with no outside instruction, but it's so easy to get these days and it saves you so much time that it sort of, it seems crazy not to include it. And if what you're looking for is easeful learning, certainly instruction will help. Instruction is, it can come in many forms. It can be a teacher, it can be your friends, it can be just from your peers, even if they can't put into words like ways to teach you, you can bounce ideas off of each other and set standards for each other. That is a form of instruction. And it can even be very internal, right? Like you can develop great skills of self critique that wind up being instructional. That's a very that's a very advanced thing. You know, that's for the middle to continuing parts of your career. It's very hard to do that as a beginner, but uh, that is a skill that you can develop eventually that is very useful. And practice is, that's pretty obvious. That is the execution of the things that you are trying to improve. That is the most important part it, by far. And it's pretty amazing how many artists you encounter who are trying to improve but really de-emphasize the actual execution of the exercises. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you want to get better, you need to do the exercises a lot, right? If you want to improve your perspective, which you don't have to, but if that's the thing you want to get better at, you need to draw in perspective a lot, right? Watch a couple videos, read a couple guides, but then cut it off fast. Don't trick yourself into thinking watching the videos is gonna make you better. You need to execute. You need to do, 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 do over and over and over again. But I wanna reemphasize again, language sort of creates this trap here, right? Where I'm talking about you have to do it, you need to go through the practice, you need to pay attention to where you're getting your instruction from, you need to expose yourself to art. Language creates a trap where that makes it sound like it's all a lot of effort and that learning is quote unquote hard, right? It is not. I'm not gonna give an inch on that. I'm telling you, it can be easy. And like I said in the video, it is automatic, or at least almost automatic. It's almost like the only non-automatic part is getting yourself to your seat and sitting down and starting. Because let's say you're practicing perspective and you're doing exercises that are, you're filling a page with one point perspective boxes. You can go through the whole process of doing the practice miserable 
miserable to the core. Behind your eyes, you are just hating it. You're feeling so much strain. You're feeling so much tension, right? And that is, to us, that is the definition of what it means for the effort of learning to be effortful, right? To not be automatic. You can be experiencing the practice on the extreme end of misery and pain. But guess what? The line going down on the paper, when it is done, it is done. It, the line itself is executed completely separate from pain and misery. You would have a very hard time getting a friend to call out whether the line that you just put down for your practice was executed as a joyful line or a miserable line, right? It's gonna go down the way you can put it down. And there's not gonna be a lot of distinction there. And the magic of it is that, let's say you do the whole practice, right? You fill your sheet with the one point perspective boxes. And at the end of it, you're like, that sucked. That was horrible. That was so much effort. I hated all of that. So it must have been bad and it must not have worked. The next day, you sit down and you try to do the exercise again and you find through all of the misery that you experienced while doing the practice that you got better, that the muscle memory still got ingrained, that things are going slightly faster, slightly easier this time. So where was the worth of all that misery? What was the cash value of it? Nothing. You still got the positive payoff. If you've ever done more than one exercise, I'm sure you have experienced this, that even when you did it in a state of pain, there was still some improvement on the other side. So the cash value of the pain, of the suffering through the exercise is zero. It turns out it had almost nothing to do with what was going on. It's a mental trap and it's difficult to make a clear linguistic case for this. So I'm instead just going to make you a personal promise that if you're going to trust me, Steven Zapata, on anything, trust me on this. There is a way to separate those things and the pain can die. It can die completely. And in fact, you can do the hardest parts, quote unquote, the hardest parts of drawing, painting, art completely without effort. The state does come. It can happen. You can get there and you can get there fast. You can get there early. It's not on the other end of years and years of effort. It is not hiding at the other side of mastery. No, it's present here, now, it's available. You can get it, I promise you, I promise you. You just need to get out of your own way, pay attention to your mental state, and don't deceive yourself. Don't deceive yourself. Be honest and aware of the data that you're getting. Make careful analysis of the outcome of your practices and the outcome of your drawings and how you felt. Pay attention and don't take for granted the fact that you will sometimes do the best drawings you've ever done while you feel like absolute shit. You'll be sitting there, miserable, grinding your head against the paper, wishing you weren't there, and every now and then you'll tune in, you'll be like, oh, that wasn't a bad hand. Oh, that's actually probably one of the better foots I've ever drawn. That will happen over and over and over again as the years go on, and the tendency is to ignore it. Don't ignore it. That was secretly the most important part of art. You had nothing to do with it. The pain you were feeling had nothing to do with it. Those best parts, those solid aspects are coming through irregardless of your mental state. And once you connect with that, once you realize that's true, your mental state fucking balances out because once you believe the fact, you can't help but experience things differently, right? You won't get so bent out of shape about feeling bad. You won't get so bent out of shape by the stress. And the change is subtle in the beginning, but over the years, it really adds up. All right, I went on a tear there. All right, question number two. This one is not terribly related to art, as in drawing, but I was wondering if you could give some insight into how to articulate and present your ideas verbally or orally. I've always struggled to express myself using words, and I really admire your speaking style and the way you string ideas together. I heard in a live stream that you taught Ahmed al Duri how to speak more articulately. He's pretty good now. Would you be able to share some of those same tips with us? Well, thank you for the kind words. I did help Ahmed in our early years in college with presenting 
I need to emphasize that it's not like, it's like he had to pick it all up on his own, right? Like he had to manifest it, he had to make it real. So I give all the merit to him on that, right? I provided some points. Here's how I think about this. You can give a lot of tips that try to make presentation and oration objective. You can talk about creating particular oratorical structures, controlling your flow, watching your ums and your ands, and all the stuff you would learn at something like Toastmasters, right? There, there is a wide variety of objective tips about that. But if I needed to communicate one baseline point about it, it's that focus on it as communication. Improve your power of communication. Don't worry so much about making it sound like how other people sound. Ask yourself what you need to communicate, what you find is important to communicate, and commit to finding a strong, clear way to get that across. I think that the best way to do that is to have careful, difficult conversations with people that you love. I know that that sounds kind of strange and maybe a little hokey, but I do think that therein lies the best training for communication. If you can have the highest stakes conversation with the highest stakes people in your life, which is a practicable skill, right? If you can do that, anything else that you need to present on, anything else that you need to talk about, it's gonna seem like nothing. It's really gonna start seeming less important. I would take every opportunity that you can get to get into the shit with people and find out how they're feeling, why they're feeling that way, telling people that you love them, telling people that you're pissed at them, like just have honest, high stakes conversations with people that you really care about and insist on being as clear and articulate as you can be at that time in those conversations right? Don't let it be vague. Don't let it be abstract. Try to find ways to make it clear and concrete. If you can do that there, your powers of presentation are going to skyrocket on their own. I will do a video soon because several people have asked specifically about some of those objective tips for presentation. Uh, I've actually done lectures on how to present your work in uh, classes that some of my friends have run in the past. So I have those notes somewhere. I will get them together and I will put them into a YouTube form and that'll get those tips out there. The best one of those tips is a little mental reminder that whenever you're presenting, whenever you're speaking, whenever you're up at a podium, up on stage, up in front of a class, no one wants to see you struggle. Everyone wants you to be relaxed. It's okay to insist on being relaxed when you go up there. You just go up there, take a few deep breaths, let people know that you're nervous. If you're feeling nervous, that'll dissolve the tension. There is this inherent pressure we feel when we're about to speak publicly. We get this feeling that uh, people are watching with a hawk-like eye to find our mistakes, that they are deeply interested in our fuck ups. They're deeply interested in where we're gonna go wrong or how bad a job we're gonna do. That is like implicitly the belief that we have that is producing this tension and this stress. Realize that that's not the case. Think of how you feel when someone goes up to give a presentation that you're not giving, that you're just listening, right? You, you don't, you're not paying attention to any of that. You are just hoping to receive something relaxed and good, right? Just think about that. Just keep that at the forefront of your mind, that it is the best thing for you and for the room if you are relaxed. Tell yourself that a couple times, take a few deep breaths, and go out there and do it. A bunch of questions here from 24, so I'm just gonna go through these one by one. I remember you saying that you worked through Scott Robertson's How to Draw in College. My question would be, how much time should I invest in every chapter and on the exercises? I worked through the course, the same course as classes in college. Uh, the book was not out when I was in college, but 
I took VizCom 1 and Art Center, which is the content of that book, with Scott Robertson and Thomas Bertling back at Art Center. It's a little tricky to assign how long you should spend on every exercise or how many how much time you should commit to a chapter without knowing you personally or where you are with your art. I'll say that when we did it in school, for every exercise, we would do like six pages of examples. So maybe that's the best I can do for a concrete bar to set. It, I think it really comes down to you. I would just make sure that you don't rush. Take your time with it. It's better to do two iterations of these very technical exercises and do them carefully and correctly than to do them over many, many times but making fundamental mistakes. That's just not gonna help you as much. Next question from 24. Who are the artists that have inspired your style the most? So there's way more than I could ever list, way too many to count because my style is very, it's flexible. I do all sorts of different stuff and it's constantly influenced by a rotating list of artists that I love and have loved. But instead of not answering, I'm just gonna have my coffee and open up my folder of general inspiration. I have one giant folder that just has everything I like in it. I'm just gonna click around and just mention some that I bump into. All right, let's see here. So Dean Cornwell is a big inspiration for me. Love the solid forms. Uh, very good combination of graphic shapes and form in his paintings. Tom Lavelle, great illustrator. Uh, have loved his stuff for a few years now. He just has such a great natural compositional sense, a good blend of staging and sort of pictorial or realistic composition. Like he knows how to cut things off. He knows how to stage things to look natural. He's a great, great illustrator. William Adolph Bouguereau, that shouldn't be a surprise. I think he's on a lot of people's uh, inspiration list. And I don't really go in for his uh, peasant lady paintings, but uh, some of the history painting that he's done, like his painting of Dante and Virgil in hell watching those two naked guys fight. It's just like, ah, that's, every, that's everything I want out of art. That's everything I want out of art. I love that thing. Saw that at the Musée d'Orsay, I think it was, recently. Bumped into it, didn't know it was there. Ah, super exciting moment. Frank Frazetta, uh, one of my biggest inspirations for the concrete like way that I draw. I think he's probably holds that position for a lot of people. He's almost a platitude in art at this point, like to say something is Frazetta-esque or that it draws its lineage from Frazetta, but he's that for a reason. He really was that great. He was that good, and there's a lot to learn there. I love Frazetta. Looking at a bunch of Greek and Roman sculptures, I don't really know any of the names for the artists who did those, especially definitely don't know any names of the lost artists of Greek bronzes, but... I love the way those look. I love the stylization. I also specifically love the way they look now, especially when they like pull an old bronze like out of the ocean, the patination and all of the shit growing on it. It's just so beautiful. That's a big inspiration for me. Uh, Michelangelo, Michelangelo Buonarroti. He is, for me, like he's the artist I think of the most when I'm just drawing the stuff that I naturally draw. Like, I mean, a lot of my art is a, uh, thick buff dudes leaping through the air, you know, and Michelangelo did that better than anybody else. He's the best. He was the best. And so unprecedented. How the fuck do you be that good without any, like, no bar is set. You just blow past the bar when you're nothing, when you're barely of age, and then you just make it all up as you go. How? How? It, I, it pisses me off just thinking about it. All right, I gotta calm down. I gotta calm down. Uh, John William Waterhouse. Uh, Lawrence Alma Tadema, salon painters that are pretty popular these days. They're having a bit of a resurgence. They did great, great work. They've been inspirations for a long time, especially Tadema for composing groups and history paintings. There's so many good reproductions of his history paintings you can find online. Justin Sweet, great production artist, currently alive. I, I ripped him off for many a year back in college. He had something I didn't have, which is that he could 
so much of his stuff really looked like it had convincingly been done in a dare to care fashion. You know, his sketches were just so fired off and I was never that. I always really overthought what I was drawing and so I found him irresistible. I was like, I must absorb this. How did he do this? I learned a lot from him. Oh, Andrew Wyeth. God damn, Andrew Wyeth. I mean, what do you need to say about him that hasn't already been said in culture? Andrew Wyeth and uh, Jamie Wyeth, I think it is. The father of Andrew Wyeth was uh, N.C. Wyeth. And N.C. Wyeth, also a great artist. One of the Golden Age illustrators. Crazy life. Crazy death. All right, off that topic. Do -do 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 -do. Ooh, Frazetta's inks. Good stuff. Looking at a bunch of academic drawings here. A lot of uh, stuff from like the Ecole de Beaux Arts in the 1800s. I've definitely spent a lot of time looking at drawings of that sort. If you just type academic drawings into Google, you'll, you'll see the flavor of them. Just very refined black and white drawings. Got a bunch of living artists here. Marco Djurjevic, Wes Burt, uh, Kakai Kotaki. These guys were these guys were pivotal for me, along with like uh, Android Jones. Those guys were pivotal for me in first getting interested in concept art, and I think that that is true for a lot of artists these days. Ooh, F. R. Gruger. Oh man, he is some. I I'm like so inspired by him and have ripped so much off from him that I forget he exists now. Sometimes he just like background radiation for my art thinking. But uh, he's not very popular these days. F.R. Gruger. Uh, Gruger is G-R-U-G-E-R. -E he did some uh, exceptionally graceful black and white pencil illustrations for magazines back in like the, I don't know, 30s, 40s, 50s, stuff like that. But I, I love his stuff. You can find a bunch of reproductions online if you search them. All right, so I think I'm just going to... that That's not even a fraction of how long this list could go. I mean... Good God. Ryan Minerding, Sadie Valerie, Jacob Collins, Doré, Doré, Doré. Oh God, Jean-Léon Jerome. So much. And, you know, I've stolen more or less from all of these artists at one point or another. But yeah, I'm just going to leave that list off for now because it, it'll spiral wildly out of control fast. Next question from 24. What is an easy way to start coloring artwork digitally? I don't think there is an easy way. Maybe one not to make it look good. Maybe the simplest way is to have clean line art and put that on a layer above in Photoshop. Or if it's on a white background, you can set it to multiply and then just lay flats underneath it, flat colors. Even that, it's really hard to keep that under control and to make that look good. For painting, there's so many different ways to get started and they're all available to you all the time. So. Uh, I would just always keep it simple. Start simple. You said you don't ask art friends about their art. So what do you talk about with your art friends? Well, to be clear, Fanny, what, did, what are you on about? Can't you see I'm recording? No, 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 no. Quiet now. Shh. I'm sure it's nothing. You know how every single other time it's been nothing? I'm sure it's that again. All right, where was I? To be clear, I talk to my art friends about art when it comes up. It's just, that's not, we're just friends. The art is not the dominant force that I want to address in them. Like anyone, I want to address the person. I always want to talk to people about how they feel as a person, you know? And if I, if we do wind up talking about their art, I'm always much more interested in how they are experiencing their art than the art itself. I'm much more interested in if it's going peacefully, if it's challenging them, if they're getting deep satisfaction from it. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw my wife under the bus right now and decry her for sending me so many pings right now while I'm recording. All right, last question from 24. You said that you knew Ross Draws. I'm sure people are interested in that. So I wanted to ask, when did you meet him and where and what you think about his content? Do you also want to do stuff like that, energetic and overtly positive? I have known Ross since college. We went to Art Center together. I think he was two years below me in cohort or was he one year below i don't really remember now that's all fuzzy but uh yeah that's where we met i think i met him through ahmed actually i think he uh ahmed had already known ross from before school or before ross entered school i think they had talked online beforehand and then 
so they were already friends when Ross started, I believe. And what do I think about his content? I think I've probably seen one of Ross's videos ever. I think, I think the first time that I saw one of his videos, I was like, oh yeah, that's Ross. I mean, that really is what he's like, you know? He's that guy. And because I knew him and because I saw that that's what his content was gonna be, I was like, oh, I think I get the picture. So I haven't really watched much of it. Um, but it's great. It's clearly well beloved by the internet. So I think there's obviously a lot of good stuff there. I mean, he's, he's super big and he helps out a lot of people. And, uh, I see, I see here that it wasn't that you didn't say overtly positive. You said overly positive. And to that, I'll say, I don't think so. I think it's probably exactly as positive as people want it to be because look how successful it is, right? It's got the right tone for a lot of people. So I think that's great. But no, I, I don't plan on doing any stuff like that. What I want to do on YouTube is more about the boring part of art. Okay, here's a question from Carol Ron. As a young artist now entering college, it's often advised to find what you like to do or what moves you and elaborate on that. But in an age of multimedia content that constantly stimulates your brain on a visual, auditory, rational, or over-encompassing range, how does one find what pushes himself to create? Is it as simple as I saw this, now I want to try that? I mean, we get that feeling from almost anything funny we see other people do. And there's a bunch of techniques almost anyone would find interesting or worth a try. And habits get in the way. A certain piece might move me tremendously, but I just don't find the time to elaborate on that inspiration. The kernel of my question is, how does one find within himself the moving will to create and transpose an idea onto a medium and how to best get in touch with the part of you that genuinely wants to express itself? All right, great question, Caron. And uh, thank you for the kind words that I omitted there. If you are a young artist and you are grappling with this, my advice for you is kind of split. I think for now, while you're young, you know, you're just entering college, this is a good time to focus just on your skills in a very simplified and raw way without too much distraction, if you can at all bear to do that, if you can gain enough interest in just working on your skills that it can fill your time. I think that now is a perfectly good time to do that. But if you are already engaging with this question of what is meaningful to me in art, what moves me, right? What am I supposed to be doing? That seems to be the core of your question. You say you're experiencing this tension about the idea that you should find what you like to do and elaborate on that, right? Find what moves you personally and elaborate on it. You mentioned that there's all these things that seem to be pulling you in all these different directions. You, you only feel pulled because you are concerned with the idea of meaning, with the idea of what your art is supposed to be doing. And if you are already thinking about that, which is a metacognitive thought, and you are not finding an answer, you need to raise the stakes. You've got to dig in. It's time to get real, right? Because that question is a big one, and you're only going to answer it with you're only going to give it a satisfactory answer, I should say, with something that is deeply personal, deeply integrated, and truly matters to you, right? The answer, by definition, must be that. If, you, if what you're looking for is meaning, it's going to be hard to feel it, to believe it as meaning if it is not substantive and important to you. So raise the stakes, right? Take it out of the realm of art. If you wanna find an answer to that, I think you need to ask yourself or start asking yourself, what do you find important in life? What is your first philosophy? What are your core principles? Are you interested in the mysteries, right? Like, are you most interested in why we're here? Why there's something instead of nothing? Uh, the nature of our experience of our lives and of existence? Like, do you work on that level? Or is that really not so interesting to you? And do you instead want to know how to live your life well? What does it mean to succeed in this life? What does it mean to succeed as a person, as a partner in a relationship? What does it mean to succeed in a particular career? What does it mean to succeed as an artist, right? Like are, are those our main concerns? Um, or is it even on a higher level than that, right? Like how? Are, are we interested in uh, how much money we can make from art to enjoy just the position, just the status 
of being an artist and making a good living off it, right? Like you're allowed to draw the line wherever you want on what you're interested in and what is important to you. And I think you start there and find how the things that are happening to you in your life reflect on that, right? Look at your family, look at your friends, look at what they're going through, look at their pains, look at their joys, and find what you connect to there. Find a way to drag that into your art, right? I already can tell that you are unsatisfied with what society is presenting you. Just the way that you say, I'll, I'll quote you again, in an age of multimedia content that constantly stimulates your brain on a visual, auditory, rational, and over-encompassing range, like your diction already reveals that you're done with this, right? Like you don't buy it, you're not drinking the Kool-Aid, it's not for you. Like so many people of this age, you'll engage in it and you'll use it, but it's not substantive to you in a way. And you instead see it as a marker, like a sign. It's almost like its whole existence to you gets summed up in there must be something other than this. So I'm giving you permission, you quote unquote, I'm telling you, please go out and find your other. Go out and find what it is. The best I can do to point you is to say, raise the stakes. Make sure it's as important to you as it could possibly be. If I had to put myself and how I feel as an example, because that's really all I have, right? I, I can only say what I've done. My art has gone through its biggest changes and given me the most solid direction when I've made my hopes for it as ambitious as possible. I want to learn something about the nature of life and death through doing a project or I wanna be able to help people with immense emotional turmoil through a project, like stakes as high as that. When I put those on a project, when I put those on art, that has always given me the most energy and juice for it. It's a, I think it's a good way to do it. So to sum up, I'll focus on the last part of your question. How to best get in touch with the part of you that genuinely wants to express itself. It is a little interesting to think, like, if you want to express yourself, it would be very useful to understand yourself. If you actually know what you're about, if you know what yourself gravitates towards, irregardless of labels of good or bad, that is extremely valuable data for then expressing it. But most people who are looking to express themselves, most people who are trying to put a message or to draw deep personal meaning from their art, they... They don't know where they stand, and they especially don't know where they stand on themselves. It would be very useful to take the time to figure that out. Xander Jake asks, where can I download your brushes? And then I laid him down on the ground, belly up, like a nice little puppy dog, and then I sank my teeth into his throat and yanked and ripped until he was in complete oblivion. So thanks for the question, Xander Jake. Another name that I'm going to butcher, these are some questions from Piotrek Zimaniak. Sorry, bud. <laughs> so one, when you consider that particular, when do you consider particular pieces worthy of showing to the world instead of dumping it in the trash bin or ending up in a drawer? For me, it's usually a time thing. I don't know. I think, I think I'm usually willing to share anything I've spent four hours on or more. And things that are less than that, you know, some things come out good fast, other things don't. But usually if I have if I have found enough meaning in it to work on it for like four hours plus, I'm usually willing to share it uh, somewhere after that. But I think it just comes down to the idea you have for the picture. I think it's ready to share at any point after you have captured the initial intent for that piece. At least that's how I experience it. Really, I think you can share things anytime. I think it's perfectly fine to show sketches, roughs, anything. Like, even if you don't think it's great, there's, it's not up to you what people derive quality from. It's not up to you what they think of it, you know? Even if you think it's terrible, even if you think it's too rough to show, if you did put it up, someone would probably like it. It might just be that you don't have enough of an audience at this point for someone in your small audience to like it. Question two, supposedly thoughts create feelings, so changing your thinking changes your feelings. Works for healing people during psychology treatment processes. So have you ever had to, or does it just happen, to change your thinking in your art journey? If so, when and what made that happen? I think I have changed my 
thinking about my art journey like every day that I've been on it. I'm constantly reevaluating what I'm doing and thinking about what I'm doing and thinking how to make it better and what I should be doing differently. There's been, there's definitely been big changes. There's definitely been big changes. They're a little hard to track, but there's certain turning points that really define how my art went afterwards, you know, like just doing art in high school to deciding that I wanted to be a concept artist. Like that was a big, like hard turn that really defined how I practiced and the kinds of pieces that I tried to make for a long time. And also the way that I thought, yeah. And then leaving school and going into work, like working in the industry and working in a studio, like that changed the way I work again because it created a split. It was like that made personal work much more important again because I was like, all right, I got the job thing. I got the industry thing. I want to kind of go back to exploring my own art in my downtime. And then I had to sort of reintegrate those personal thoughts and personal desire desires for drawing that were outside of industry concerns. And then after my dad died, that gave me a big push to make personal work that was really focused on, I don't know how to put it, like how I felt or communicating something about this experience. Uh, and I think anybody who deals with loss probably has some sort of moment with like that. I think that that is a common thread in a lot of people's journeys. And final question, what's your favorite ice cream flavor and ice cream parlor? Don't have a favorite ice cream parlor. I wish I did. Now now that it's in my mind, I wish I had a favorite ice cream place to go to. But uh, flavor is definitely salted caramel. God damn, so delicious. Thank you. TRS asks, can you please share exercises to practice the fundamentals, example perspective, for the people who don't have the money or time for art school? Honestly, I would recommend just going on YouTube and searching for free courses on whatever fundamental you want to practice. The trick is to just do the exercises, actually do the practices, don't just watch the videos. So I'm sure if you type in perspective for beginners on YouTube, you'll get a bunch of free videos by a lot of great artists going over the basics. Don't just watch them, do the exercises. I don't really, yeah, for perspective, I don't know any in particular, any free courses, but I know there's gotta be a ton out there. Uh, Proko stuff on YouTube is really great. And there's just so many good artists making content. Yeah, I, I would honestly recommend just looking for free content and not worrying too much about if this is the ideal free content to watch. That really is not a big fucking deal. Just do the work. Just actually do the exercises. It's up to you how much you get out of it. Stanislav Palov asks, what are those classic realms of study we're referring to? So in the What is Drawing video, when I mention the classic realms of study, I'm talking about stuff like anatomy, perspective, design, lighting, color theory, just the, the basic tent poles of art. And what I was saying in the video at that point was that the particular way that I use those, anatomy, design work, the lighting in my rendering, that all of those are just my personal cherry picking and taste within those classic realms of study. A comment from Leonardo Maltez. I had to actually speed down so I could listen carefully. That was enlightening. As someone who's struggling with anxiety and trying to make something happen, that was heartwarming. Still, the unknown of will I be able to make a living with art is very frightening in itself. It is, I know. I know when there's uncertainty and you don't know how things are gonna go, that's very scary. I have been doing this for a long time and I still experience that. I mean, I'm experiencing that these days. I experience it every time I'm between gigs, you know? There's always some fear. There's always some reticence. There's always this feeling that it can all disappear, go away all of a sudden, and that'll all be for naught. But those feelings are, they are exaggerated. They go beyond what we actually have data for, all right? And you are already making a living with art. You're already bearing it great and it's with you and it's in your life. You are living with it. You just want to add money into the situation. And that's its own little game. It's all little left and right. It's own little duck and weave, you know, and you're going to figure it out. You're going to figure it out. I'm sorry to hear that you're struggling with anxiety. Yeah, remember the main points that I'm trying to get across. 
art itself, the act that you're doing, the act of creation, the practice of making art, there is no anxiety in there. All of the anxiety that we feel from it and that we feel surrounds it, we're adding it in. There is nothing concrete ever being pulled out of art. We are always adding it in, right? So art in and of itself is not stressful. Art in and of itself is not uh, an act that produces anxiety. You make the anxiety, you project it onto the art, but it doesn't have to be there. Slowly, as you recognize that more and more, as you connect with that, as you integrate that truth, the anxiety will lessen, lessen, soften, soften. Things will get better. Another comment I want to commune on from Cassie. I agree with the last statement. It's the artist's mind that is more interesting than the drawing itself. I feel like this is something we take for granted in art since we see it as a visual medium. But in a way, art is no different to a mathematician using scratch paper to solve formulas. The symbols themselves have no meaning. They are just a mental guide. Cassie, you nailed it. Or at least I think we are very aligned on these feelings. I, I agree. I wholeheartedly agree. Definitely think the artist's mind is more interesting than the drawing itself. I don't think the drawing is anything, you know? There is only this communication from person to person. The drawing is, by its nature, empty. It must be empty to allow for communication to flow from one end to the other. It's just a self-same, empty and filled vessel that allows communication. Wow. All right. I went too far there. <laughs> Sorry. But yes, the symbols have no meaning. They are indeed mental guides. Everything in a piece of art is a mental guide. Points your mind to a particular place, right? Like even the fall of light on a form in a painting, it is pointing the viewer's mind to imagine this is real, right? And it happens subconsciously, right? It happens inherently, all on its own. The viewer sees the illusion of light on the form sees the light tones against the dark tones and the transitions in between and whether it is if it's convinced of the form it is convinced immediately and if it isn't convinced it is often not convinced in a way that in a way that implies that the mind has a vision for how it would be convincing so in a way it is already still hopelessly engaging with it it points the mind everything in art points the mind it's all guides, and it's all communication from one mind to another. Marco asks, amazing video. I am still an aspiring artist, but then maybe I'm not. The ideas are always there. I just struggle with the physical representation of them, and I mess with multiple mediums all the time. Even a walk with a friend can be art when you discuss some topics. It's like a dance of intellect and thought. A question for the Q&A. Do you envision what you're going to draw before drawing it, or do you feel it, carve it from the blank page? I mean this both in the macro sense, for this piece did you already have the general concept of the faces turning and such before putting your pen to the paper, and the micro sense, before drawing the hands did you envision them in your mind as finished hands. So first let me address the beginning of the question. I'm still an aspiring artist, but then maybe I'm not. The ideas are always there, I'm just struggling with the physical representation of them, and, the, and I mess with multiple mediums all the time. Yeah, I, if, you, if you even have to question if you are or aren't an aspiring artist at this point, you just are. You just are. If you weren't, you wouldn't even have it in you to ask the question, right? You wouldn't have a self-awareness to that part of, for that part of yourself that would allow you to even question it, right? So you are. You are. You're already engaging with it. You're just in this process of actualization and integration where you're, you're not quite ready to claim that title yet. But it will be very important for you. It will be that first step to start making those physical representations, finding ways to take those abstract, uh, ephemeral impulses of feeling like an artist or feeling like you have something to put out there and just concretizing them. Just get them out there. Just do it and, and see what happens, right? You don't have to feel totally committed to any medium or any process in the beginning. Just start. Just begin and analyze as you go, analyze after the fact. But first, let's take that first step, put one foot in front of the other. So as to your question, if I have a plan or if I carve from the blank page, for most things that you would see on this YouTube channel, I'm usually feeling it out and carving it, 
from the mind page. I don't usually envision super clearly what I'm going to do before I start drawing. I do that a bit when I work for clients because there's just such a the client is giving you a brief, right? They need a specific thing. So there's already such a solid starting point that it's much easier to flash a concrete image of what you need to produce. And then you can just sort of race for that. But in my personal work and stuff that you would see on this channel, that's usually not the case. I'm usually starting based off of an interest in an initial abstract idea a slight impulse of an arrangement of feelings and forms there's not enough of a concrete foundation there for me to distinctly envision uh, what the finish is going to be for these kinds of things and for the drawing that was in this video uh no the, it was mostly carving it out but when i work for clients yeah there i do spend more time distinctly envisioning things and then going for what i saw Okay, so I believe those were all the questions for the what is drawing video. So now we're going to move on to some questions that I got on how to get into the zone. Let's check it out. So Damien has some questions about tech and then wants to know, if you were learning drawing from the beginning, what learning path would you choose? Would you start with figure drawing, perspective, etc.? Let's say if I want to achieve the level of your drawings, what drawing routine would you recommend? For me, it's getting a little overwhelming. I don't know what learning order would be the best to progress. Maybe you could make a video about something like this. All right, so first, as to hardware, if you wanna get into digital art and you're looking for a basic laptop drawing tablet setup, you can start super simple. So definitely for Photoshop, you don't need a laptop. You don't need anything over $1,000. Like a very low end like gaming PC will probably do you fine for anything that you're gonna do while you're starting out. In your learning period, you don't need to handle too many layers, stuff like that. You're not getting commercial work, so you're not getting crazy files from other artists. Like, you'd be fine with a relatively cheap laptop. So something on the lower end for like a gaming laptop would probably be fine. I'd say you probably don't need to spend more than 500 to get a laptop that would be able to handle some basics in Photoshop. And as for tablet, uh, you can get a small one. Just get the entry level small, either Intuos Wacom Bamboo small size or the Intuos small size. Any one of those is a good place to start and it'll sort of help you break into digital art with broad strokes and simplicity in your application. You can't get too complicated if you're not working on a big tablet. And then as you try that out, you can move on to something else after that. And so for the second part of the question, what learning path would I choose if I was a beginner now, if I was starting over uh, with the hindsight that I have now? It's a very personal thing. Um, I don't want to prescribe for you a particular path, and I'm sorry to hear that you're feeling overwhelmed by it. I would tell you to not worry so much about the order and what order is best. I would instead take it one step at a time. Deal with the present first. Just ask yourself, what part do you find interesting right now? You know, are figures what's interesting you? Is that what you want to be doing? Is perspective interesting to you? Is design interesting to you right now? Whatever is interesting to you right now is not always going to be interesting. Your interest in it is going to wax and wane. So you might as well use the energy that you have for a particular subject right now as a reserve of energy to do studies and do practice. You don't need to have a perfect order of study laid out. It's, there might be times later on where that becomes important, but if you're in a stage where you're feeling overwhelmed, like you're obsessing too much over whether you're doing it in the right way or not, just turn it off. Just turn it off. Just say, what am I interested in right now? And lean into that. Do that for a while. And in doing that, you will gather data. You will find out that to do this thing better, you need to bring up certain other aspects. If you want to integrate this thing that you were interested in into a bigger project, you would need to sur you would need to practice these other things that surround it. Look for whatever you are attracted to right now and go with that. Don't worry too much about a perfect path because no one can give you a perfect path and there is no perfect path because it's completely individual. The path that works for one artist is not the path that's going to work for the other. If it did, it would be boring. You wouldn't want to do this anyway. Art is supposed to be individualized. Everyone's path is supposed 
to be different or else everyone would wind up producing the same thing. My path is super easy to describe because it's mine, but you couldn't possibly do it. There's no way you could be on the path. You could, you could never do the same things that I did and you shouldn't want to, right? You shouldn't do the same things that I did. And when you have been on this path and when you have discovered beautiful things from it and integrated incredible things from it and turned it into a thriving, lively art practice, uh, you will see that no one else should be on your path, that your path was your own and that it was important that it be your own. Don't worry about a perfect order so much. Just go for what your psyche is attaching to right now and figure it out. Peter Liu asks, I have a question about anatomy, if that's okay. How do you learn the movement of muscles and bodies? I have a pretty good idea on where the muscles are and how they look like when the figure is in relatively still position. But when the figure starts to move and stretch, it becomes much more difficult to wrap my head around how to draw it. Thanks so much. That is, it's a tricky one. That is a, like, that is the final layer, I would say, of the typical analytical figure drawing path. You start with overall impression of what the figure presents as in space. You then move on to a conceptual understanding of anatomy and learning a little bit of the science and the objective parts of it. And then the movement, the stretch, the, the dynamics of it, that is the final layer. To address that well, in the clearest way, you want to have a very firm grip on the objectives of anatomy, right? So you want to know attachments, placement of the muscles, like you said, and you want to be uh, very confident with having a reference of a figure, either a live figure in front of you or a photograph, and capturing its essential gesture and its presence with consistency. Once you have that, you combine them. So you combine the an analytical knowledge. So the bicep has an origin here and inserts here. And then when looking at reference from its various positions, it changes its shape and its form, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There is no shortcut to it. It is pure exposure. You would drive yourself absolutely crazy trying to memorize the deformations of every muscle in all of its various engagements and trying to have that down so pat that you could just produce it from imagination consistently. Fortunately, you would never need that. You, for something like the human body, the human body is probably the most complex subject you can draw, but because it's the human body, there's tons of reference for it, right? You can always find some sort of reference to use. So you don't need to have perfect analytical knowledge of those deformations. You can always find something, some kind of guide for what is happening. And if you want to make artistic or memory-driven statements about those things, it's pure exposure. It's just pure exposure. And it's pure exposure to reference, right? You're not gonna be able to make that stuff up on your own. It's always going to, if you observe carefully, it's always going to surprise you and shock you just how weird and bendable the body is from different views and in different positions. So there's no shortcut. You just expose yourself to it a lot, draw carefully, and try to understand what you're seeing from the foundations up because that takes that realm of study away from memorization and integrates it on its own. It's like, because you understand it, you don't need to have anything memorized. When you try to reproduce it, you just know, of course it's going to look like this because this, 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 and this. So JS's comment starts with a nice bit of sharing about how he felt automatically in the zone when he doodled when he was younger. And his question is as follows. How does one focus on doing it like I wanted to, even if it's not good, while being in the zone? I consciously know that I need to fail so I can grow, but the feeling of constantly failing burdens me so much that I get frustrated and suddenly get distracted by everything and unconsciously walk away or do any other thing. I also know that with more failure, I get better, but the feeling of it paralyzes me so much that I don't know what to do. Anyways, thanks for this vid, and I hope you guys have a great day. Well, thank you for the kind words and know that the problem you have presented is common. It's a cornerstone of the art practice and you're not alone. The best advice I can give 
to fight the feelings you described is to increase the scope of your awareness while you work. What I advocate for is a more holistic practice, right? So when you sit down at your desk to draw, go in knowing that it's not just about the drawing, right? Give yourself a greater responsibility than that. Take responsibility for the drawing and how it comes out, but then also take responsibility for how you feel while you work, right? Because it's going to be inflicted on you anyway, the way that you have described. It's going to creep up on you, the fear of failure, the anxiety of not knowing what you're doing, the anxiety of not knowing how it's going to be received. It is going to crop up and surprise you. What you want to do is go in knowing that it's coming, knowing that it's natural, knowing that it's nothing wrong, and you want to, instead of snapping into it and finding that you're anxious and scared after you've already unconsciously been anxious and scared for a couple minutes, you want to feel it arise. You want to be drawing, 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 and then you want to feel that emotion come up. You want your awareness to be sharp enough that all of a sudden you tune in and you're like, ah, oh, there it is. Yeah, I can feel it coming right around the corner. There, there's the fear. There it is. Now I'm afraid. Now I'm anxious. Now I don't know what's going to happen. Now I just want to quit. Now I just want to walk away. You just want to have that also be included in the practice. Don't let that be something outside it. Don't let it be the art practice is the drawing and it all gets dismantled and falls apart when I realize that I'm burdened and scared and that I've fallen out of the zone and that I can't, I'm not relaxed. No, 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 no. Accept that, embrace that, add that to the practice. It's drawing and peace. It's drawing and conflict. It's drawing and fear. It's drawing and anxiety. And it's all integrated. It is all in the sphere of your care. And you are going to address the anxiety and the fear the same way that you would address a problem in the drawing, right? You're going to connect with it. You're going to view it. You're going to scrutinize it. You're going to criticize it. And you're going to make a, attempt to make a correction as best you can, if you can, all right? Now, this is going to be really hard at first. It's not easy. It is very difficult. It takes a long time to make progress with that kind of mental skill because it is a skill, right? It's a new skill that you're trying to learn, how to regulate your mental state while you do this particular task. It's going to take time to get a grip on that, but it is worth the investment of time always. So be patient with yourself and just set an intent when you sit down Say, I'm taking responsibility for this drawing. I'm going to I'm going to sit and make this attempt, but I'm also taking responsibility for the way that I feel while I do it. And I'm going to be mindful of it. I'm going to be aware of it. And I'm going to try to connect with every experience. And don't try to don't try to push it away, right? When you feel the anxiety coming on, don't resist, right? Don't just label it as bad anxiety uh, and just try to push it out and keep it away. No, no, no. Just treat it with equanimity, all right? Just defend yourself with acceptance. Say, here's the anxiety. Old friend, how many times have we done this dance? Anxiety today, I will attempt to see you not as an enemy from outside, but a reminder that I really care about what I'm doing. I would not be able to produce this kind of nervous energy for this blank piece of paper, which is nothingness, unless I really cared about it. And to care about something, that's a gift, it's something to be grateful for. It is at least not apathy. What is worse than apathy? What is the feeling of dead inattentiveness. It's, it's one of the worst things. No, no, no. We have interest in this. We care about this. This is our passion. And sure, maybe it's not going ideally right now, but this anxiety is a sign that I care. It's an anxiety that it is an anxiety that says I am involved in the outcome. And for this encounter with anxiety, I choose to draw the line there and just accept that. And maybe it's not so bad. And then maybe next time we draw the line somewhere else. Maybe next time we say, fuck you, anxiety, you can't be here right now. Maybe next time we have to say, fuck it, anxiety wins, I give up. But for this time, defend ourselves with acceptance. Just feel the feeling completely. 
and give it a chance to unwind itself and dissipate on its own. Soy Boy says, love your work and philosophy towards it. My question, how do I build a visual library in my head to give me the tools to take a concept and articulate it without limiting myself to a photo reference or past work I've seen or done? I think that a visual library is not just a vaguely memorized visual list of particular shapes. I think that that is a part of it, but I don't think it's just that. I think the visual library has an underlying current of understanding why forms are the way they are, like understanding why things that bend look a particular way, why things that are straight or rigid or supporting look a particular way. Those underlying whys are the connective tissue between the known and the unknown areas of your visual library, and they are what allow you to remix. Do your photo reference work, right? Look at the shapes uh, of the world around you and break them down into simplified forms so that they are memorable, but then also take the time to try to learn why they look the way they look. That why will really cement it in your head, and that is what will allow you to produce it from memory or from imagination without needing to rely on references. Maherko asks, without considering my current level at art, how to know which to focus on, environments or characters, to eventually get a job? While I enjoy both of them, can I be good at both environments and characters? Any help, please, Steven? Maherko, I need to ask you. Who told you what to think? Who put it in your mind that you can't be good at both environments and characters? Did you hear somebody say that somewhere? I know I've heard people bring that up or say something to that like, or that you need to focus on one or the other to get a particular job. You don't have to. It can make it easier if you're on a deadline for getting a job or something like that. Obviously, if the jobs that are available are environment-based, having environment based work is what you want but in a more general sense if you enjoy both do them both and let them improve each other right let your environment work make your character work better and let your character work make your environment work better there's no need to draw these arbitrary distinctions and there's every kind of job under the sun in art you can easily there are many jobs in art that require both that need environments and characters. Don't limit yourself. You don't need to do one or the other to get a job. If you enjoy both, do both. And then it's your responsibility to apply that and find work that will utilize both sides of your skill set. Next up, Mei Lu. I'm really glad that I could give you a little dose of optimism and hope. I'm glad you enjoyed James's podcast that was a lot of fun to do and uh, thank you for the kind words so let's uh, look at your questions first one how do you set a specific intention when doing an art session I often struggle to set a specific goal other than to just make a good piece well I don't think there's anything wrong with having a goal as general as make a good piece I think that considering how much artwork you need to make and put out in an art career to really have it thriving, uh, that that is going to be the best you can do for at least some of the time. You know, you, you're not always going to have a razor sharp focus that's going to allow you to uh, set bigger intentions than that. It's perfectly fine to have make a good piece as a intention, but if there is a reason or a call to do something more specific, I just base it on on feeling and. How to put this. Honestly, if I think about it for a second, I don't really set specific intentions when I'm doing my own art. If I'm working for a client, they give me the intention, and that's pretty easy to square away. But when I'm doing my own thing, I don't really set specific intentions. Um, if I have a story point that I'm trying to illustrate, that's about as close as it gets. Instead, I like to get into the drawing. I like to get into making the piece of art and then I like it when it surprises me with an intention that I was not aware of, you know? Uh, I do really believe a lot of art making is completely automatic. 
And if you sort of come at it through the back door that way, it if you trust that it's automatic and that it's going to do the whole process on its own, it leaves you that opportunity to be surprised by what your art means to you. Does that make any sense? It does to me. So two, flow is the middle ground between anxiety and boredom. How do you gauge the complexity of a task to take on that is ideal for your skill level? I think for beginners, um, anything more complex than fundamental exercises is uh, going to really stretch you. It's going to push your limit. Once you're intermediate, you can move beyond fundamental studies more often. Once you are more regularly engaging with ideas and concepts and making art that is about things, that puts you into the intermediate category. And then once you can do that without too much strain, once you can regularly just take on ideas that matter to you um, and the technique sort of becomes a secondary thought, then you're really in the advanced or expert category. It is difficult to gauge exactly where you lie on that spectrum at any time and what the appropriate kind of work is. I always guide people to just stick with their interest because it doesn't really matter where you are on the spectrum, if you are deeply interested in something, if you are very captivated by a subject, that will give you a wellspring of energy that will allow you to move past your limits and do things you didn't know you could do. Three, a lot of external stimulus in the background is distracting. How do you train yourself to be in the flow state even amidst chaos, like a noisy classroom? Well, I think for some people, there won't be any training that away. I think for some people, they will always need to be in a, in a special environment to make their art. That's just going to be the case for some amount of artists. For those of us that that is not the case, um, I think it is exposure. Like, if you put yourself in more and more extreme situations, uh, you will get used to it, and it will make it easier for you to cut through all of that crap and just connect with what you're doing no matter what's going on. I personally have had some trial by fire experiences that have made that a lot easier. Going to school, going working around other artists did help me with that, but also when I was working in studio and doing uh, brainstorming sessions with clients and doing like super fast sketches like right there in the room with them when they were the ones who had all the money on the line, like that got me used to it really fast. If you can cut through that level of distraction, that level of anxiety and just do the drawing, that'll train you to get through almost anything. Also, I think streaming has helped me with that. You know, knowing that I'm just on the internet going live and anybody who would be interested could just step in at any time. That sort of has helped me get over that. I think it's just exposure at that point that that is you have to add wood to the fire for the fire to grow more intense. You need to practice being able, you need to practice cutting through to the core of your experience in a variety of situations. All right, thank you for the questions, Meilu. Those were very good. Stardust Observer says, sorry if this is a bit blunt, but I was just wondering if this whole drawing thing was for me and if I should stop or not. And after hearing you were gonna do a Q and A, I just wanted to hear from your perspective. When would you want to stop drawing altogether? If so, what will you do afterwards, fictionally speaking? What was the most powerful spark in your life that made you want to do art? Lastly, are you more of an artist or more of a performer? Mm hmm. Very interesting question. When would you want to stop drawing altogether? I'll be honest, I can't imagine a situation where I, where I would permanently not want to draw. I can imagine any variety of situations where I... I don't draw anymore because I can't, right? Like something happens in my life where I need to reprioritize everything, you know, and I need to do stuff for my family or just, you can imagine any amount of disaster scenario where you need to put yourself last and sort of rise up for the people around you, right? Like I can imagine a bunch of stuff like that, but where I wouldn't want to draw, where I would want to stop drawing altogether, I can't imagine that. I would even in the midst of those worst case scenario turmoil nightmares, uh, I would imagine that in my experience of them, I would always be thinking of how can I get back 
to drawing. It's just such a deeply ingrained part of my life at this point. Honestly, I don't know how I'd fill my fucking time, you know? I, I, I would get so miserable watching movies or TV or trying to buy time doing other things. Like, I, I, I need to do some sort of creative, creative outlet, for sure. As to what I would do afterwards, I mean, that, that kind of gets to it. Like, I have no idea. If I stopped drawing, what would I do afterwards? I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know what I would do with those eight hours a day. Uh, what was the most powerful spark in your life that made you want to do art? I tell the damn cat story with my sister almost every time this gets brought up, but my, when I was just a kid, my sister showed me how to draw a cat, like a cartoon cat, and I fell in love with it. That was it. It's ineffable, you know? I can't put it into words. There is no moment of spark that I can use to define it. It's just a natural part of the process that is me, you know? As a, as a pattern of being, that has always been there. It is a natural part of what it means to be this ego, this identity, you know? There's no, I feel like I have to rekindle the spark every day. It's not just that there was this one moment that has been pushing me down the path of art ever since it happened. No, no, it's every day when I wake up, I have to remake that spark. I have to recommit to it every goddamn day, sometimes every second of whatever I'm working on. And lastly, are you more of an artist or more of a performer? I think that they're the same. I think that they're the same. Doing a drawing, even if I'm doing it completely alone, like no one's watching, it's not for anything, I'm not, even if I'm never going to post it, there is always at least an audience of one. There's me, right? And much like if I was watching a performance uh, a, even a, a movie or a theater show, much like if I was watching that, my drawing and its ups and downs, its successes and its failures are going to make me feel a particular way through the process of executing the drawing. I am both the performer and the audience of this. I think being a performer and being an artist are, are the same, are the same. They're unnecessary distinctions. I think that those borders are greatly blurred. And to get to what's going on in the background of your question, right? That you're wondering if this whole drawing thing was for you. It is, try it. If you're wondering, if you're interested, that's already evidence enough. If you didn't have some energy for it, you wouldn't even be asking the, the question. So just dig in, dig in and don't, I, I appreciate that you asked, that you're asking me to try to get a different perspective on this question you're asking yourself, but shouldn't matter. Who am I? I'm just some dude on the internet. You don't, you don't need to listen to me. You need to let me tell you what to think, especially not on whether you should draw or stop or start or anything. You should just follow what you feel. All right, I think that is all the questions answered. There was a couple comments from Exidium JTR and let me look at this, who's the other one? TRS that I wanted to just talk about, but they weren't really questions. Unfortunately, this video has gotten crazy long, so I'm not gonna get a chance, but I just wanted to shout you guys out. Thanks for the comments. Thanks for the thoughtful things that you said. I really appreciate that. And uh, if you made it this far into the video, all the way to the end, uh, thanks for sticking around. And I hope if I missed any questions, you guys will resubmit, I think I got them all. But uh, just know that I was trying to answer everybody. If I forgot to answer your question or if I missed you, uh, it was unintentional. So feel free to pop me an email or leave your comment again or leave your question again in the comments. And I will try to either respond in an email or answer your comment right here on YouTube. Thanks again for all the questions. And if you have any questions about these questions, feel free to leave those questions in the comment section of this question and answer video. All right, everybody, talk soon.